I was originally going to make this post on the this post this video on the anniversary of this post and uh, the series that gave birth to it, but I realized I'm going to be pretty slammed over the next few days, and I also realized fortuitously that today is actually the anniversary of something far more important, America. So I am using my blessed freedom to do it now. Anyway. Uh, the unfortunate rage quit copy pasta is well known at this point, uh, so we won't really be retreading what it is. What we're going to be doing instead uh, in this revisiting of it uh, five years after the fact is investigate, you know, was it really justified? And I'm not talking about is this level of getting upset over Pokemon justified, you know, or, you know, writing with this level of self-righteousness or pompousness or whatever that I don't really care about that I'm talking about the idea uh, that this entire post is predicated on which is that McMegan completely robbed Lavos and uh, some other ideas but mostly that you know was it really blind luck and nothing else so uh, we are not going to deep dive the games themselves uh, in fact if you'd like to see the games deep dive in real time. I believe I recorded them live with Blunder. And, you know, there are some interesting games, but we're just really interested in, uh, today at least, in w whether there was true robbery or not. So, uh, we are going to... I don't know, we're not going to break down every single turn of potential hacks. Oh, well, that Thunder could have missed the Cloister. It could have paralyzed the Cloister. It could have crit the Cloister. Nothing like that. We're just talking about the egregious instances. You know, the stuff that is low percentage, that really couldn't have been played around, stuff like that. So, uh, this was a very well-played game on both sides. As I recall, McMegan made a very crucial blunder down the line, and Lavos just ran away with it. McMegan was not able to come back. I don't quite recall what it is, but I'm fairly certain I will know when I see it. I think it had to do with rapid spinning with Golem, but uh, couldn't tell you. Anyway, uh, McMegan, I believe, is using the uh, the double dog golem stall built by ABR and myself, and Lavos is using the IFM slash Hodor, you know, Eggy Raikou golem offense. So it's just lovely to see golem, but so far nothing really hacks wise uh, that you could recognize. And I remember this game being pretty long, so golem gets a spin off there, so that's definitely not what it is. Uh, some nice roaring from Lavos to get some extra health back on Golem. Very well considered. And a uh, nice move from McMegan there to not completely fall behind. You know, it would be very easy to rest there with Lax if it does have rest. I think it does, given that the original team did have double-edged thunder, flamethrower, rest, Lax. But yeah, that was a nice move. And uh, now in comes Golem to spin again. So McMegan's got a great advantage, seeing as Cloyster is low on health. And... Yeah, now uh, Lavos' response is not immediately putting the spikes back up, so McMegan has a major spikes advantage. Uh, and he's even preserving Skarm's health. Very nicely done. Hidden powering. Uh, yeah, Sleep Talk Thunder. That could have HP iced, I suppose. In comes Heracross. McMegan with a lucky Megahorn dodge. That wouldn't have you know done a million, but it would have done a fairly significant chunk. But, you know, with Golem's leftovers taken into account, uh, let's say that's nothing too egregious. There's Suicune shrugging off Giga Drain from Executor because Gen 2. And it appears that McMegan has put Ice Beam on this uh, on this Suicune. I believe the original had Toxic because it's better. But let's say he just wanted to increase the odds. Anyway, another Sleep Talked uh, Thunder from Raikou. And there's a Roar from Golem. So dragging in the other Golem for more Spikes damage, nothing too significant yet. Goes for the EQ, knowing that Golem is pressured uh, more on Lavos' end, since it also has to deal with Spikes. And a nice double to Raikou there for McMegan. I think, uh, oh, and he's doubled to Golem there as well. McMegan's making some nice moves. So Heracross is going to rest, and we're going to skip ahead through the more uneventful aspects of this game. But uh, we'll slow down if we see anything egregious hacks-wise. Well, that Skarmory could have full parrot as it rested, but it did not. 
I guess Stun Spore had to hit it in the first place, right? See, you see how many odds there are in Pokemon? Anyway, Golem gets a spinoff. Ooh, that's a bad... Okay, that's a bad move from McMegan there. Going for that Toxic. I don't know what that was, who that was trying to hit. You know, it definitely wasn't trying to hit Golem, because you're... You'd surf there. I don't know why you don't spike every time. I guess if you think Cloyster's coming in, then you can get the Toxic on it immediately and then do more damage to it while you set while you both set up spikes because the Toxic is already activated. But no, that's a major mistake. And now he's not going to stand. Now he loses spikes. He had free spikes. I don't know why he didn't do that. Um, and now he's going to suffer for it greatly. So, ultimately, uh, a ni some nice doubles for McMegan there. So denying the free spikes, and he gets a, actually a pretty nice double edge crit, uh, and a beautiful move from Lavos there, switching Raikou into Snorlax. You know when the Snorlax could have stayed in and double edged again, but but uh, excuse me, Lavos recognized that uh, McMegan was going to try and take advantage of the lax uh, being forced to rest, or you know if it chooses to stay in. You know, either you switch to Golem because it walls it, or you try to rest with Lax, and both of those are covered by Cloyster. So Lavos made an amazing move by going to Raikou there, uh, really reading McMegan's double switch. And again, you know, just look what ha would have happened if um, Mc yeah, if McMegan had popped that spike up. So that claim of Lavos is that you know his play was superior, based off that you know uh, errant toxic, which yeah, the toxic. Actually, I guess the play was superior, but at the same time, the Toxic missed the Executor. Like, yes, it was a worse move, but at the same time, the Executor should not be gaining health. You know, should in quotation marks. I understand that there's percentages and odds and all that. But, uh, yeah, so now uh, Lavos wins the speed tie, hits the Toxic, so, like, Megan's already taken some damage if he chooses to stay in. And, yeah, now the Toxic lands on the Executor, but crucial uh, ground lost so a nice double to Suicune there on the golem so McMegan you know making his way back in I, I would have to say they're fairly evenly matched throughout this game it's just that uh, Lavos isn't making any missteps so you know in terms of understanding the game state they're more or less on par but McMegan fell crucially behind you know nothing that's going to ruin him necessarily uh, and he also you know got a little helped by the uh, Megahorn miss. Uh, so yeah, Lavo is definitely you know more deserving of this one. So he rapid spins. Uh, Heracross does not sleep. Talk a boosted Megahorn, and now here comes a Drill Peck on the Skarm. Drill pecking it again to get some more chip on it. Getting ready to sacrifice Suicune to a boom if that's what it takes, but maybe not because Golem's still around and very healthy. So sleep talking Ice Beam there. You know that's. Uh, it's not Surf, which would have been more threatening. The Raikou comes in to absorb the Surf. So, but then again, the uh, Suicune could have also rolled Rest, which would have done nothing. So, nothing too egregious so far as um, Raikou roars while at lower health and drags in Golem, and with his own Cloister Toxic, then he is now um, yeah, gasping for air almost. So, Golem gets Whirlwinded there. Nice move by McMegan. Um, I'm not sure about that move from Lavos, because... I get, No, he didn't want to get Raikou roared. No, never mind, I take that back. No, Cloyster, you don't want Golem, you can still deal with it being roared at. So, yeah, that's a nice move. Uh, you don't want to risk uh, Hair... Uh, well, obviously not Heracross, but Snorlax either. So, uh, yeah, Golem into Golem, and it just barely, you know, lives that EQ, which does, you know, higher roll than on uh, McMegan's. But Alavo stays in to uh, keep Golem out of, you know, maybe win the speed tie, but also McMegan might switch. Also, you know, if you uh, switch Golem out, it might just get KO'd by spikes anyway. And so, yeah, and that's uh, McMegan's problem now. Golem has taken a huge hit, and he's still contending with spikes, and does not have his own. So that position that he was forcing Lavos into earlier, uh, no longer really, you know, the tables have turned. So there is a crit para from Thunderbolt, not Thunder which uh, lets McMegan uh, force a rest from Lavos a little earlier before his own Raikou might be forced to. Lavos going for a hidden power. Ooh, now that's uh, that Lax is in danger, danger range. But uh, it does not sleep talk a thunder. Well, I'd have to hit it as well. 
And uh, Heracross comes in on rest to protect Golem, and now in comes Golem. And, uh, sorry, we skipped the turn a little too much by accident. So, yeah, Lax just stays asleep, and now Heracross comes in, uh, hoping to catch the switch to Suicune, maybe? Not uh, Cloyster, that's for sure. But uh, it was also a fine move anyway, because the uh, Snorlax is not boosting. So, with the double edge recoil and Megahorn's big, uh, huge power, uh, and your only ability to heal with Rest Hog, that was a nice middle ground move from, uh, from Lavos. Also to not... Actually, no, no, it was a great move, because that way you don't incur more damage on Golem. No, that was a very, very well considered. You know, Heracross can kind of pivot around the Lax, and Golem does not want to take any damage at all. So we just use the Sleeping Lax to get more health back on Golem. Very nicely done. So, uh, Sleep Talk Thunder Miss, but that one would have gotten rested off. That would have needed a crit. But yeah, Lavos is really uh, in the zone here. Like, Megan's kind of keeping up, but... You know, the little, the little details are starting to burn. So, uh, there is Lavos' Lax going to blow up and down go both Laxes. That, uh, that Curse Boom Lax generally tries to hit Skarmory for the benefits of Heracross. But uh, that's not what's going to happen here. But then again, McMegan has lost his Snorlax. So, Raikou Wars once again. And comes Cloyster to threaten against a... No, I just wanted to get some lefties. Uh, so, which, I mean, is a great move, of course. So another roar, and that roar winds up dragging in Golem and bringing it to 34%. So that roar actually helped Lavos quite a bit. And now, great double by McMegan, pivoting to Golem on that Raikou switch. Uh, so beautifully done. So he gets the doesn't get the spinoff. He blows up the Cloyster. So at least the Cloyster won't be threatening with its own boom. And, but the thing is that, um, McMegan cannot spin anymore. Not that he was going to, anyway. But yeah, uphill battle from those earlier decisions. Look, Golem getting more lefties. It's still an HP ice range, but there's a double switch to Cloyster, trying to get those rocks up, and, uh, it, those rocks, those spikes up, and the Heracross has to not sleep talk a Megahorn, but Megahorn also has to hit. And, uh, da and the spikes go up. Now, can they be preserved? And Suicune is coming in because Skarmory lets Golem into spin. So Raikou comes in, cursing from McMegan to try and punish the Golem a little bit. Cloyster actually, he gets a spin block because Cloyster gets KO'd by Spikes and Toxic since you take poison damage switching in in GSC. Uh, there's a nice roar from McMegan, and he actually brings the Golem back down, finally. Uh, down to 33%, so you know definitely not uh, jumping out of HP ice range anymore. Another roar, another Heracross roar in. You could say these roars are also you know luck, but we're not going to go that far because we're talking egregious cases. Beautiful double to Golem there as Heracross threatens out Raikou. The spin goes off, and uh, it's very very uphill for McMegan at this point because since Cloyster gets KO'd by the I don't know why he didn't go to Cloyster for the spin block honestly. Since Cloyster uh, gets KO'd, I mean, you get that as a spin block. You don't get it as a... You can, don't get to spike with it anymore. Anyway, so there, uh, I think that crit didn't matter at all. Now, this game was absolutely wrapped up. So, yeah. Well, that was definitely the deserving winner there. We move on to Gen 3. Here comes Skarm into Metagross. Magneton comes in, trapping the Skarmory immediately, KOing it. So, Magnet, good roll. Uh, stuff like that. You know, you could also crit para, but, uh, or para, full para. But all in all, let's just assume, you know, nothing unreasonable there. So, McMegan is running a physical offense team and is going to struggle into a bulky team even after trapping the Skarm. Uh, classic. This is why I rail against physical offense all the time. It is truly terrible. In comes Metagross. Quite a lot of speed on that one. And with the little damage it's doing with Meteor Mash, you can tell that is a bold-natured Celebi. And uh, a jolly Metagross without choice band, so Salicberry almost surely. So Salamence further revealing this team's uh, physical offense nature. And in comes Titar, the sand goes up, Snorlax is getting worn down, just switching into bulky Starmie with a spike. So now it's really getting uh, getting ruined. So yeah, McMegan's getting worn down awful fast and not making much progress at all. So in comes... Magneton trying to T-Wave Bliss, do some, do some fun stuff there. 
Uh, and a nice double to Blissey. As Mence switches into Swamper. You know that's never a good sign. So, the double to Blissey just to scout if it's HP Grass or not. Um, yeah. Metagross comes in. Blissey is protected. Uh, Bulky Starmie shows his defensive use by being sacrificed to Metagross as opposed to the much more valuable Swampert. So you don't have to worry about, oh, Skarm went down, now I have to throw Swampert into it. And uh, I risk getting boomed on and getting swept by a D-Deer. Nothing of the sort. So, Celebi and Starmie really help in that regard. Magneton goes down with a Screech. So that threatens Blissey out uh, from the Ments and gives it a free DD. Trouble is, uh, Swampert is at full health. And there's not much to do about that. Not even the fact that this is a DD HP Grass Ments with a ton of Spadef. Now, Spadef DD Ments is not bad, but uh, DD HP Grass Ments is very bad. And uh, Lavos realizes, oh, my Pert doesn't counter it. Fortunately, my Celebi does. So, Celebi countering DD Ments is truly depressing. And uh, he goes for the Leech Seed into a Rock Slide as opposed to Psychic. I'm not sure about... Well, I guess he gets to stall it out this way. But... Um, I think it was much less risky to just go for a Psychic, considering if you Leech and, you know, miss or get flinched. Well, if you if you miss, rather, because if you get flinched, it doesn't matter what you do. So, it's more about the Leech accuracy. But, uh, yeah, the Leech Seed uh, winds up getting Celebi a little bit of health back, but, you know, winds up losing health because it got flinched anyway. So, when he comes in HPS, Jolteon does not scratch the, the perp, so... As far as preparation and play, uh, Lavos is definitely coming out on top of this one as well. Because, yeah, McMegan's team here is, sorry to say, not good. And, you know, not that Lavos' team doesn't have uh, its own issues. I mean, Doug Trio, my lord. But beyond that, it's, uh, it's definitely the better team of the two by a significant margin. Now we move on to RBY, everyone's favorite tier to cry luck in, even though half of it is full paralysis, which definitely doesn't exist in any other generation. So, we see some T-Waves exchanged. We see Psychic and on a Seismic Toss. There's a full para. Here's a Body Slam critting. Mmm, that's an ugly one because Snorlax's crit rate is actually very low. And, yeah, but, you know, you could have also said full para, but you can still switch out of a full para. So, very, very lucky from McMegan's end there as uh, Lavos wanted to stay in, get a T-Wave off, and slow the Lax down to make it much easier to deal with. Uh, now, he still would have had a very low health Starmie, and it would be risky to keep it in, risk of getting Hyper Beam, but he also could have switched out. Not, but either way, you know that was still going to leave him with a very low health uh, paralyzed Starmie without it, without the help from a crit, um, you know, at best. So, yeah, still very lucky, though. Now... Uh, Chansey has also hit Sing on the first attempt and slept, uh, won a speed tie at that, and also hit Chansey. So, definitely some nice luck here. Now, is it game-breaking? We don't know, because whatever Lavos' own Chansey wanted to do was also maybe not the most game-breaking thing. Could it have sung? Maybe. You know, and, but in that case, it's just a true 50, or, you know, true 50, uh, 50. Uh, but yeah, now, the sleeping Chansey is not waking up yet. As Cloyster tries to... As McMegan's... I mean, he's definitely improving his eyes. He's got a lot of ice moves on this team. And he's very happy to spam. So, at a certain point, it's less uh, less blind luck. And more attempted luck. You know, a strategy Lavos was very famous for himself. Uh, when he was one of the most um, well-known users of Jinx in GSC, he would consistently get freezes with it because he would consistently put himself in positions to get freezes with it. So that was definitely not blind luck, nor is McMegan's uh, intentional spam of ice beam, uh, or ice moves here. And there is a fortunate blizzard uh, miss on the Lax, so he gets away with that one, and a clamp miss on the Chansey. So, you know, a little bit, you know, nothing a huge, nothing in comparison to McMegan, but, you know, the idea that it's, you know, outrageous at this point, don't really know about that. There's a Body Slam para, so, you know, it's starting to come back, uh, starting to swing the other way. Big Megan does arrest it off, but the fact he is forced to arrest it off, you know, that's a turn he uh, could have used for something else. But again, not egregious, I don't think. In comes Tauros to take advantage of the Sleeping Chansey, which has a, had a very long sleep. Now that is lucky, so it's not just, you know, hitting the Sang, winning the Speed Tie, but also the sleep lasting for quite some time. So, uh, 
Toro's body slams the lax three times, no crit. That's a form of luck in its own right, honestly, given Tauros's impressive crit rate. But, uh, hey, nothing too bad. Here comes Zapdos, Lax burns a turn of sleep, and then comes a Rhydon. So, uh, Lavos has the better end of this preparation. So, Chansey comes in, scares it out, Ice Beam again. And these Ice Beams are not just looking to freeze, because half of the time they're aimed at uh, sleeping Pokemon, but they also have the potential to crit. And remember, even Chansey, you know, a slower Pokemon, still has a significantly higher crit rate than it would have in any other generation. You know, Gens 2 through 5, no, 2 through 6, had uh, the crit rate of 6.25%, and in RBY it's based on your speed stat, and even Chansey has something like 10%. So, uh, similarly to how if you spam a lot of Ice Beams, then you are eventually going to... Uh, there's Executor pivoting into a clamp, trying to burn. Oh, uh, Lava is actually PP stalled Cloister out of blizzards. Very impressive. There's a clamp miss, one after several attempts, and a psychic special drop. So now Cloister uh, is threatened by the other one. So a little bit back there, uh, but nice double to wake up with Chansey. But now uh, Lavos is forced to switch Tauros into Tauros. So that obviously gives McMegan a huge advantage in the Tauros War. And then he also gets the crit, and then wins the next speed tie. So Tauros comes out quite unscathed there. You know, relatively anyway. So in comes Exeggutor, and Alakazam blocks the Sleep Powder. There's a nice full para to help Chansey out a little with getting back up to full health. Here comes uh, McMegan's Chansey, who is not threatening Sleep, but is threatening Freeze. And there's, again, another crit from... But that's the, you know, again, this Ice Beam has been... Um, oh, I guess it was uh, threatening Sing. I lost track there. But... Uh, it was threatening to crit on several occasions beforehand. So it's not just, oh, it crit on that one turn. Well, it also could have crit on several other turns. So this is, again, something I want to stress that a lot of great players do. Um, you know, whichever all-time great player you would care to name, they have had many a game. You know, maybe they're even renowned for it, where they say, you know what, I need a crit, I need a freeze, I need a whatever the hell, and I'm going to present my, put myself into enough into sufficient a sufficient number of positions where I can go for it. And at that point, you know, like if you need um, one out of two Focus Blasts to hit, you know, then it's not the same as needing two out of two Focus Blasts to hit. I mean, it seems obvious, but you know, people say, oh, you missed a Focus Blast, that's hacks. It's like, well, it's not quite that simple. You know, if you hit seven Focus Blasts in a row and then the eighth misses and all seven previously were important, it's like, okay, but remember, you hit the first seven, so... Anyway, some uh, more stuff was happening, nothing too egregious at this point. But uh, yeah, Zam continues to block the Eggy. Rhydon comes in. Cloister and uh, Rhydon getting chunked. I mean, Zapdos is still not a threat necessarily, but it's, it's closer to being one. Anyway, in comes Chansey, which has been uh, slept again. Free switch to Tauros. And that is a KO. So double to Rhydon trying to make something happen. But Chansey is just going to uh, need like an Ice Beam miss, a 1 out of 256 miss on the sub, and then a crit with uh, EQ for any chance. And even then, Tauros is in range, or is out of range for EQ, so you'd have to crit the Tauros or have it dodge a Blizzard or something. So odds are very low at this point. Overall, I mean, definitely some uh, you know favorable luck on McMegan's end in this game, but I don't think it's particularly egregious. You know, it uh, definitely swung... I mean, you could say favored, sure. Uh, you, I wouldn't go so far as to say the series absolutely should have ended here because it wasn't the kind of game-robbing type of luck. It was more the kind of luck that just swings. But then again, it swung back in the other direction. And what's more, McMegan also played very well. I think in this game, they were quite evenly matched. So it was the little things that swung it. Um, and yes, luck, but you know, winning a Zapdos versus Rhydon matchup takes a lot of skill as well. So I think uh, this one was deserved, if we want to use that word, just like the other two were. So now, uh, Gen 5 OU, we see a matchup of Rain into Weatherless Offense. Now this is an advantageous matchup on McMegan's end. I don't know if we can call this preparation superior, but you know, even if we're just talking good matchups means better preparation, which I don't necessarily think is true, but even if we just do say that, and Lavo still has had three advantageous matchups. You know, even if the Gen 3 one was more McMegan kind of doing it to himself, it's still an advantageous matchup, so nicely done there. 
So by virtue of that, then you could say, oh yeah, well Lavos is definitely uh, you know out prepared. But in this matchup, uh, not going off of team preview anyway. And uh, McMegan leads off beautifully with Scizor and gets a nice big CB U-turn on the Rachi. In comes Terrakion, so much pressure right off the bat. And in comes Dragonite into Stealth Rock. Now Dragonite into Rocks is a, a risky one. It lives a banded or ba banded rock gem, uh, Stone Edge. So that's useful. Uh, but I guess he was afraid of Sash, so he didn't want to send Starmie into it. But uh, Dragonite definitely would have been useful in this matchup. Uh, so I'm not sure that was 100% the move. I mean, you could debate that one back and forth. I don't think it was an egregiously bad play or anything either. So Starmie, generally a safer bet, I think. But uh, yeah, you could see the merit. Especially since Tarag goes down, Starmie now gets the spin. The benefit of spinning, I'm not so sure, will be as apparent with, uh, with what's it called, with Dragonite so low, and Kieran Black still being very vulnerable to Garchomp, and Scizor, and Keldeo, and even a Focus Blast Thunder Asterion. So, I think uh, Starmie was better, but, but hey, you know, you could make a case for it. I don't think it was awful either. So... Uh, Thunderous is doing some stuff, and Garchomp comes up short, and down it goes to HP Ice. You know, these Thunderous like to run bulk, so uh, it's not surprising that it lived that outrage. So, Ice Beam goes down, Starmie gets the spin off, and there is a CB Pursuit taking the Starmie down. Now Magnazone will remove the Scizor in return. But uh, now Keldeo comes in, and with Secret Sword, nothing switches in, as Dragonite is too low, Ke Jirachi is too low, Kira Black is too low, and yeah, it's a Specs Keldeo, so Kieran Black drops. And there is the sweep. So yeah, I think Dragonite definitely should have been preserved for the Keldeo. Yeah, we see a nice big E-speed doing over half, but uh, not enough. So McMegan resoundingly the winner in this one. So now we're at 2-2. I think... Um, you know, the one games were deserved on both sides. I don't think uh, the luck was blind either, you know. Um, in RBY, you could say, yeah, it swung more McMegan's uh, way. True, you could also make the argument he gave himself more chances to have that luck flip uh, in his team building choices, in the battle itself. So, uh, yeah, I mean, ju just the fact that Lavos was forced to switch Tauros into Tauros already using Body Slam. You know, not even like a clean Tauros War 50-50. You know, uh, and I recognize that other things came before that, of course. But, yeah, I think uh, McMegan was definitely making the most of his tools there. So, yeah, and honestly, you could even say, I don't even know if you would say this was an outclassing in preparation, seeing as uh, the... Uh, Cloyster really gives a lot of support to Zapdos in Rhydon matchups, as we saw, you know, and uh, even the triple KO Chansey, you know, with uh, Sing and then Ice Beam Freeze and then, oh, it's not triple KO, it's uh, T-Wave over Counter, my apologies. But yeah, this kind of Chansey with Sing and then uh, Freeze Fishing with Ice Beam, then it makes up a lot of ground. So even if you don't get full use of your Zapdos by virtue of facing a Rhydon, you will still get a lot of mileage and to win a Zapdos in a ride-on matchup is impressive. So, and only losing one Pokemon, too. Now, again, luck made it helpful, but still. Anyway, so I think um, this was definitely deserved, you know, preparation-wise, play-wise. So now we get into the, fi uh, the final, the famous, the, the DPP game, the Gyarados. So, here it comes. Um, Gyarados into Heatran. Now... You know, losing the lead matchup is not bad preparation because if you have a good team, you simply uh, you simply are prepared for whatever lead is going to beat you. There's no such thing as a lead that beats everything. You know, and even uh, sometimes you will have a an advantageous lead matchup, and then your opponent switches to something and just completely nullifies it anyway. So it's not the biggest thing in the world one way or the other. So if your team is well built anyway, so Gara into Gara is a good move. Uh, McMegan going right for the aggressive DD. Good move. This aggressive DD is not attempting to sweep right off the bat. It's more to try and you know, really take advantage of you know, teams that are soft into Gyarados, number one, that rely on pivoting around it because they don't have a really tr good true check. Like if you have an offensive Suicune, then you are absolutely destroying uh, DD Gyarados. 
Uh, so in that case, you are trying to sacrifice your Gara early on just to get a lot of damage on the opponent. You know, which can be a very worthwhile endeavor. Once Suicune goes down, then a lot of other stuff. Infernape, DD Tar, Metagross, Scarf Flygon, they go absolutely crazy. So it's a good strategy to both really make sure you bludgeon whatever check is coming in, and if your opponent is going to have a team that's soft into DD Gara, that relies on a lot of pivoting into it, then you are going to be able to punish it. So I'm not going to diagnose Lavos' team as such, because you don't want to switch, we know he's a Scarf Thunder Punch Jirachi, you don't want to switch that into a Choice Band Gyarados Waterfall in the first turn. So, you know, Gar his own Gyarados is definitely the better move. Now in comes Rachi. On the second DD. So, uh, with uh, this, we know what's going to happen. We know that Waterfall, McMahon goes for it, and... Yeah, the Jirachi gets flinched, which, first of all... I, any time a Jirachi gets flinched, there is some sort of, co I mean, if it's an Iron Heading Jirachi, anyway, if it's like a Calm Mind Jirachi, then no, I wouldn't say it deserves it, but a Scarf Iron Head Jirachi, simply by bringing it, that is an attempt, a, a very conscious attempt to flinch out the opponent uh, at some point. You are using your speed to try and pull that off. You know, that's half its revenge killing tool. Iron Head doesn't check DD Tar because it Okos it from a huge range. It checks it because it does a lot of two KOs, and it also is very likely to flinch it. So, uh, just as one example. But yeah, Jirachi getting flinched. Other than that, you know, we know it has Thunder Punch, and we know the Gyarados has Lumberry, not Wackenberry. So, we don't know McMegan's spread is the thing. But Gyarados needs quite a bit of bulk to have a chance to survive a max attack a Jirachi Thunder Punch. So we're just gonna say that it was KO'd. Now, was that DD worth it? I mean, very well, it very well could be. You don't know if this is a Scarf Jirachi or not. You don't know if this is uh, a Calm Mind Thunderbolt Jirachi or not. But either way, getting a lot of damage on Jirachi is very helpful. We know McMegan's gonna be running some sort of uh, very offensive team. There are a lot of very French, uh, Belgian French, uh, offenses out there that run Lee DD Guerra. McMegan himself was very fond of this team built by a Nelson X, which uh, to my recollection was Scarf Heatran, uh, Gengar, Stealth Rock Tyranitar, Agility Empoleon, and Breloom. Yeah, so if he's running that, which has been a comfort McMegan team for, you know, a decade, uh, maybe not at this point a decade, but, you know, at the point of this battle, you know, well over half a decade at this point, um, then, yeah, beating Jirachi down like that, whether it's Scarf or Calm Mind, is very advantageous. You open up, you know, half the Pokemon on that team. So, yeah, uh, it, very, very worthwhile, potentially. And, of course, you have the flinch rate and the crit rate. You know, if we're going to be technical about the odds, it's not just the flinch, uh, but it's the crit. And, uh, yeah, Lavos famously goes, no, 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 come on, in the chat. Which, you know, people like to cite this. I, I don't like when people rip on this in particular. Because if you've ever had a game with any sort of stakes at all, people say, oh, stakes in competitive Pokemon? Okay, we're here. Let's not pretend like we're above that, okay? We're invested. It is not weird to be invested in a video game. Especially once you get to this level. So, uh, I will say that I don't blame Lavos for, you know, expressing that. Uh, and I don't like when people rip on that part in particular. Yeah, yes, it's ki it's kind of funny in the context of the meltdown that happened after, but I that part I don't like because I, I think you know have some empathy for it in this position anyway. So uh, yeah, personally I, I also think you know it's best to just leave everything for after the battle, uh, which is easier said than done. By the way, I have had plenty of moments where I have gotten very very upset. Uh, in the chat, in the battle, but you know what always happens, I, and I wound up noticing, I wound up, you know, swearing myself to silence after, and that's why, you know, in my later years, then, you know, whatever silly thing happened, then I would, uh, wouldn't really say anything, but uh, even if you think, oh, we're just gonna say it really quick, and then I'll be fine, by typing it out, you are distracting from your ability to think further. Now, whether this actually has any impact on the moves you make, uh, you know, that depends. It's just generally good practice to not do it. But I understand, you know, in an emotionally charged situation like this, then yeah. So back to Gera, uh, bringing McMegan's Gera to uh, plus zero attack once again. So 
Um, but the thing is, he's just going to DD again, because unless uh, some sort of Stone Edge pops up, then, you know, it's not going to be threatening at all. And while they're both at plus one attack, McMegan's is also far faster. We don't know its last move yet. I don't remember what it is. Oh, it is Stone Edge. Okay. So, you know, you can take a boosted Stone So that was, you know, definitely the right move on McMegan's part. You know you can take an unboosted Stone Edge and then KO back with a plus one, and you don't want to risk taking a plus one Stone Edge yourself. Yeah, in comes Breloom. Now, knowing that this is French Gara lead, uh, you... With, which runs uh, Lumberry and Substitute. It's uh, an anti-Rose Raid and Machamp tech. Uh, also very nice for things like will o -Wisp, Heatran, but yeah, it's mostly for those two. Now, generally that Gyarados ran bounced, to my recollection, but you know, if you want to run Stone Edge on it, you run Stone Edge on it. So, that also means Breloom walls the coverage, but we don't know how bulky the Breloom is. Okay, it's bulky enough to take plus one Waterfall. Uh, also, uh, this Gyarados tends to not run that much attack, but actually... Yeah, I think it's not a max attack Gera, just based off how much damage it's doing to what is assumedly a... Well, it's a max attack Scarfrachi, so it's not going to have less than 176 speed EVs. Uh, and... Yeah, it's and that's 80 HP, so yeah, 80 HP. So I don't think it's going to... I think it's a non-max attack Gera, also evidenced by, you know, it's... I'm sure this Breloom is bulky, but there we go. Um, yeah. So, it's bulky, but, you know, only taking 39 from plus one Waterfall. That's, you know, definitely the sign of both a bulky Breloom. But, you know, on a team like this, you want Breloom to not just be bulky, but you want it to dish out hits as well. So, it's not like it's going to be max HP and also a million defense. So, yeah. Um, uh, with that in mind, then we see the Spore, we see the Lum, we know it is, in fact, French Gera. With that in mind, it is very possible... Oh, it's not Substitute here, it's Taunt. So McMegan was making some tweaks. Okay, so he taunts on the second Spore attempt. Uh, I was a little surprised. I don't know if Lavos knows about the French Gera, so I don't know if he was expecting Substitute or not, because you know the whole idea is of French Gera is once you su once you DD on the Roserade that has slept you on the first turn, the second turn you sub on the second Sleep Powder, and then you just dominate it. But, you know, Taunt over Substitute fulfills a similar purpose, lets you threaten Gyarados, or Gyarados, Skarmory more, so, okay, I can get behind it. So, uh, now another Waterfall, that one flinches, okay, that's ugly, and uh, in comes Jirachi to get sacrificed, rather than risk it, uh, because, yeah, that, that one's, un okay, to pardon the use of unfortunate, that one is unfortunate, the flinch on the Breloom, but the thing is that Seed Bomb isn't too KOing back either. So, what, and you're, if you're switching out at that point, I mean, I guess you could have said, oh, uh, Seed Bomb it twice, because you're living two Waterfalls after Poison Heal, and then you, you know, Revenge Kill it with Priority or something, but I'm not sure what Priority is likely to be there. I don't think there's a Scizor likely to be there if Scarf Rachi is. Uh, Dragonite alongside Gyarados, I don't see that. You know, uh, Lucario alongside Breloom is not likely. And what other priority are you likely to, ha likely to have? I don't think Infernape's Mach Punch is going to be there. So forgive me if I'm f missing something obvious, but I don't think so. So, uh, I mean, if anything, Breloom's Mach Punch is the likeliest priority here. So yeah, you see Bomb it twice, Mach Punch it, but then what are you doing against it? I mean, I guess you would, uh, fire, you would live the... We know the... Uh, Heatran lives because it's sashed. Uh, said I'm not super fond of, but I understand that it has its uses. But yeah, the sash Heatran lives, so I guess you would seed bomb it twice, mock punch it, and then you can finish it off with Fire Blast. Although, you know, hitting Fire Blast through Waterfall Flinch, not the greatest odds. But, you know, I understand you're, you know, scrambling given the unfortunate nature of the Jirachi. So, um, yeah, but, and then obviously this flinches. But McMegan's so, uh, and then Lavos forfeits, and that's the game. Yeah, so I, I would say the the really egregious part here is how quickly the game spiraled after Jirachi's flinch. Because I don't think... Um, I don't think that the other stuff was really going to bring it back. Because once Jirachi got flinched or, you know, crit, 
then it was just a matter of, you know, the Garrett didn't do anything, the Breland wound up losing at plus one, uh, the Heatran, I mean, even if the Heatran blew up, you, you could even make the argument that Heatran should have been the number one switch because Garrett can lose one-on-one. -on -one. You know, at least if you lose, um, you know what you could have done? After Jirachi gets Lynx, go, go to Gera, uh, go to, then that's going to draw a DD, and at that point you go to Heatran and you explode. Now, obviously if you think this is French Gera with Substitute, you might not want to do that, but seeing as Lavos wasn't expecting the Substitute given his second attempt at Spore, then I assume then, by that logic, then you would want to go to Heatran on the second DD and go for it. So at that point, you know, you would have only, quote unquote, lost Heatran and a significant chunk of health on Jirachi, which is bad, to be sure, but it also, um, yeah, it, it also would have been better than, you know, losing Gera, then, you know, Breloom gets chunked, and then, I mean, obviously, I'm not saying this wasn't ridiculous salt in the wound, and it wasn't an egregious example of Gera flinching, but uh, I would say, you know, now we're starting to get to the, the juicy stuff, the debate, and I would say this is an example of uh, a lot of teams that are, you know, soft into Gera that collapse if one flinch takes place, that's generally something you want to avoid. You know, it's the same reason why if your team is destroyed by Gyarados and your only way, uh, only thing standing in the way of it is, let's say, a slower Rotom, then you are very Gyarados weak. Not just because it can get pursued, of course, but because, you know, it flinches a slower Rotom and then what? You know, so you got a guarantee, you got that sand, that priority, that th those rocks already up. And obviously, this can pose a great challenge to uh, to DD Gera. So, yeah. Uh, now we get to the argument. So then, I'm not going to argue the you know, haha, it's funny that he gets mad because again, I I don't um, really agree with that. We're just looking at the facts. So he said, I had you, Thunder Punch, Jirachi, guaranteed Oko. Yes, okay, it's sure hard to dispute that. This is the biggest threat to his team. I don't know. If, um, yeah, okay, I don't know that that's definitively the truth, because, you know, I would dare to say that something like Agility Metagross looks similarly terrifying, uh, based on the fact that there is almost certainly going to be a Tyranitar there, but, but sure, let's just say, okay, it doesn't have to be a single biggest threat, you know, it's an emotionally charged moment, so just a big threat. Played around it to the best of the ability, that... Okay, he so said best of your ability, sure, that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, the best moves possible. So, okay, you know, we can accept that. Um, but yeah, a lot of luck. But, uh, and this, and after RBY, so now, you know, we've already gone over RBY. I don't think that was particularly egregious. But I understand in the moment uh, that, you know, you're going to be upset. You know, people complain about luck in the heat at the moment that maybe it wasn't as big as they originally thought, obviously. So, um, yeah, what really, you know, generally what happens after a game like this, you know, no matter the stakes, is that, you know, someone will, you know, maybe make a mad post, like, oh, you know, this, this sucks, uh, Pokemon sucks, I hate hacks, stuff like that. Because generally you will cool off, or not, not cool off, but you'll just, you won't have the energy anymore to expend on, uh, on anger over it eventually, so you just kind of tire yourself out and say, yeah, Pokemon sucks, GG, or no GG, whatever. So, yeah, now let's get into the details of this. Uh, unfortunate doesn't begin to describe my series. Yes, okay, I mean, yes, it was unfortunate, but I would say it definitely merits it, it, the descriptor, for sure. I wouldn't say that it was so egregious that it was, you know, defying the limits of language, but, you know, okay, let's, let's just call it hyperbole, but I, that's not accurate, we know that. Game Rewards, blind luck and nothing else, I'm beyond convinced at this point. Yeah, okay, you know, it's, it's hard to argue that Pokemon doesn't reward stupid stuff constantly, you know, but this is a hyperbolic statement, we don't really need to, you know, uh, really deep dive into that one too much. After getting completely tooled by uh, scheduling with my opponent, changing times on me last minute, and refusing to provide confirmation prior to the day of the match uh, t as to play times. Okay, I don't know. I should have checked if that was, uh, if that really happened or not before. Let's see if uh, McMegan made a post about it. 
but you know what? We're going to go to McMegan's profile. Actually, it might not even be on his profile, so you know what? Never mind. But yeah, uh, McMegan, he's my buddy, but he has been known to be difficult scheduling. So while I'm willing to give the benefit of the doubt, and you know, maybe this was maybe not as egregious as Lavos is putting here, you know, McMegan has been known to, you know, push times. Uh, actually, you know, he, uh, so famously so, that in 2015, McMegan was constantly getting uh, extensions in tournaments, and he was facing Heist, aka Babidi 1998, aka the Grand Babido, and Heist was so upset about McMegan's scheduling that he made an enormous post, or not even enormous post, just a very angry post about the million extensions McMegan was getting and how he had to play on his terms and all that. So, yes, McMegan is quite famously, you know, very willing to push games and opponents have to adjust. So, okay, let's let's give that point to Lavos, sure. That is frustrating, and it is. I have been in this position. If you get someone pushing times on you and then they luck you, infuriating. Okay, very fair. Uh, losing this way somehow felt even worse than I had thought possible. Um, yeah, this is where it gets interesting because Lavos had won this tournament before. Um, yeah, like... I don't know. I, I understand like the desire to do it again, but it's not like you know losing at this late stage after such a great performance after winning this you know the year before you know like it was somehow going to you know lower people's perception of him obviously this is part of the unhealthy relationship many of us have or have had with this game but yeah i understand that it doesn't feel good because especially when the the chat turns on you but we'll get to that preparation was superior i don't know about that one you know, we've already established it in each of the games given. Uh, yeah, GSC, sure, you could make that case. I don't think he had a particularly advantageous matchup in GSC, actually. I think this one really could have gone either way. It was really more his, you know, far superior play in McMegan, you know, slipping up in, over the course of a long game. But yeah, so then Gen 3, no doubt about it. Gen 1 could go either way, you know, but I think that's fair. You know, you could give this one to Lavos, but, you know, I think it's roughly the same as GSC, you know, uh, because, you know, a little bit of an advantage Lavos, but then, you know, even. So, even GSC, advantage Lavos, little advantage Lavos, advantage McMegan, and then Gen 4 is definitely advantage McMegan, because even if you put aside, yes, the Gyarados flinch, the Jirachi and everything, then you are looking at a team that is very, very soft into DD Gera as a whole. And if you're that soft into DD Gera, you're not just soft into DD Gera, but other physical threats. Like, uh, mostly, we mentioned the Agility Metagross. Uh, something like, even Iron Head Jirachi is going to wear you down very quickly. You know, if you've got a Sash Heatran lead, and then other things like your own Jirachi being Scarfed, Gyarados. Uh, I don't think there was a Starmie on that team. That could have helped out with Gyarados' Stealth Rock weakness because it was not used to uh, s to switch into Gyarados at all. So that makes the whole thing even scarier. So yeah, I don't think the preparation was overwhelmingly superior. The play being superior, GSC, yes. Gen 3, yes. Gen 1, you know, we could... I would say this goes right down the middle. Gen 5, McVagan's better here. Gen 4, you know, goes right down the middle. Say, say, even if you want to give it to Lavos, I don't think it was outright superior. Yeah, so I don't think this statement is true as well. Now, I understand, you know, it's, uh, if you're just going to make a quick mad post, it's like, oh yeah, well, I was better and you, uh, you lucked me. Okay, sure. But if you're going to write this level of detail, it takes so much time that generally you, you're, feelings will calm down enough to where you're going to want to, you know, make clear statements and not, yeah, hopefully uh, making that clear because that statement itself was not as lucid as I would have liked it. So, in order to practice what I preach, uh, if you are going to take the time to make such a lengthy... Why did character assassination pop into my head? That's not the right explanation, or the right way to describe it. If you're going to take the time 
to so lengthily describe your superiority, then you should make sure it's really accurate. Uh, because otherwise videos like this might get made down the line. Um, I'm just kidding. But yeah, so I recognize though that it's hard to say that because so many people are biased. It's like, oh, of course I was better. I did all these things better. It's like, were you actually in... You know, very few people are objective. It's the same as people winning a game and saying, oh, I played that perfectly. It's like, did you? I know you won, you played very well, but did you play perfectly? So, uh, yeah. And I lost. Play as superior, play as superior, and I lost, so I don't see a reason to continue engaging in an activity where what is within my control is overwhelmingly outweighed by what is not. So this is where it starts to get a little rich for me. Uh, considering this is not a new idea, Pokemon robbing you, you know, I mean, this is why I push for better tournament formats, double elimination, stuff like that. But, um, yeah, Lavos had been around for a long time at this point. You know, it's not like luck was... Luck in Pokemon was some sort of new idea to him. And what's more, Lavos was also quite famous for getting a lot of luck. Now, I'm not saying that Lavos only won things because of luck. Far from it. Lavos was an amazingly talented player. But what I am saying is that for a long time... His success in GSC was nearly synonymous with Jinx Ice Beam freezes, you know. And yes, it takes skill to go for those Jinx Ice Beam freezes. That's what I'm saying. But at the same time, you know, luck happens. You know, so much so that, yeah, if you've got, you know, everyone who's ever succeeded greatly in this game, as Lavos has, is going to do so with help from luck. You know, obviously, other there's other times where you lose from luck. You know, so. I, I get irritated when someone says, oh, well, it evens out over time, because uh, if you ever watch certain players play, you know that is definitely not the case. But yeah, every once in a while, even historically lucky players will get bitten. So what this really read like to me, why it you know, uh, got on my nerves a little bit, was that it kind of, you know, Lavos had been on a very lucky streak for a long time. And so this read as, you know, him experiencing his first instance of bad luck and you know, not getting away with it. You know, finally not Jinx Ice Beam freezing his way through everything. You know, and um, if you want an example, if you think I'm just talking out of no, out of thin air here, there was a World Cup game around this time where uh, August versus Philip seven oh eight six, and August won the game. And uh, at the end, it came down to Milotic versus uh, Choice Band Tyranitar. And the Milotic crit the T tar. Milotic was faster, and it crit the T tar with Surf for a KO. But the only way T tar was KOing Milotic back was with a crit. And uh, there's a log of this where uh, Lavos goes, "Yes, yeah, sorry, this is actual garbage." Uh, after the Milotic crit the CB tar, and ABR responds, "You had to crit anyway?" Question mark. And Lavos goes with Stone Edge? Question mark. Question mark. Question mark. Uh, so that's the level of luck he was accustomed to. If I go for the high crit rate move, it will crit. He was expecting to crit with a high crit rate move, which again is not that high. And you had to hit Stone Edge and you had to crit it. And you did not get crit by the Milotic Surf in the first place. So Lavos definitely had a very skewed relationship, viewpoint on and relationship with luck. So, uh, yeah. Done with competitive Pokemon, you won't get a fond farewell community is infected at its roots with a degenerative disease that grows stronger over time and stops sh but stops short of killing its host. Uh, colorful phrasing, I can appreciate this. Okay, so this is also wh where it gets, you know, kind of rich. More than kind of. Tournaments used to have a competitive spirit at their heart. This has been transplanted by replaced with an artificial organ that feeds on vitriol and mockery from insecure little boys that heckle by the sidelines and tear each other to shreds over scraps of attention. Okay, nobody is going to argue this point, least of all me. My distaste for the Smog Tours culture of the past half decade or so, where people seem to not even be paying attention. To the, they pay attention to the game insofar as they look for things they can yell, at, yell about obnoxiously. You know, I've seen so many cases of them just being outright wrong. You know, my favorite instance is when, you know, someone made a double switch uh, in an advanced game in SPL, and that double switch actually wound up being unfavorable for them, and they had to switch out of it. But the, the Spock Tours chat was just like, oh my god, is he the GOAT? 
over and over. How does he do it? Stuff like that. Even though he had made a play, it wasn't a horrible play, not by any stretch of the imagination, but he had made you know a play that was not successful. It was ridiculous. That kind of stuff is commonplace. So yes, I agree that it is not just misinformed and stupid, but outright malignant because it's people being nasty to each other over validation. Okay, no issue with this. Um, yeah, here's the problem. Once again, this came from... It's not the point that was being made. And what I really disliked about this point being made was, again, not the point itself, but that people were saying, you know what, guys? Lavos may have overdone it, but he has a point. We shouldn't do this. We shouldn't... Which, okay, sure. But with this either... You know, people saying this were either forgetful or ignorant of the fact that Lavos was one of the most vitriolic contributors to these, you know, mockeries of the smog from the smog towards chat. You know, he was there constantly, you know, belittling and humiliating people who were playing. He would often do it in the battle chat of games, you know, against players he deemed not worthy of his full attention. You know, he would get matched up with some scrub who didn't know how to play GSC and GSC Cup, and then, you know, just rip into them. You know, I'm listening. I'm saying. I remember this one case where he said, "Oh, I'm listening to an audio book while playing," and um, yeah, this uh, I just want to challenge. Da da da. All this other stuff, and yeah, it's very easy to say when you're playing Scrubs. But yeah, so the point was that Lavos very much reveled in this same kind of toxicity that he was then criticizing. I mean, it's a, it's a tale as old as time. Lavos was not the only player to participate in Smog Tour's nastiness and then get furious when the game finally didn't go his way and the Smog Tour's chat turned on him. You know, so many other players have done it. And again, unhealthy relationship with the game. You know, a lot of people are not... This is very present nowadays. You know, it's part of another video I want to make. But, you know, it feels like so much nowadays... Uh, that and there are documented cases of this in case you think I'm just old man yelling at clouding uh, but players being less and less interested in the game and more and more interested in like the social media aspect you know with the battles being kind of secondary you know and not that we don't come to Smogan for the social aspect of course but it's so much so that the competitiveness is just secondary so yeah not a bad point just a very very hypocritical one and to make it here is just, you know, very rich. So again, I, I don't really have an issue with the language used or, you know, the points being made necessarily. Yes, Pokemon is stupid. Yes, you know, uh, people are nasty about Pokemon. But when it's coming from the person who has, you know, participated in so much of this, then it's very rich. The environment we foster has trapped us all like this in a vicious cycle. Escaping it requires acceptance of the harshest reality. We all scramble to explain away that none of the countless straining efforts we put ourselves through here will ever amount to one shining, single shining glimmer of significance. I mean, I guess it depends on how you define significance. You know, uh, time enjoyed is not time wasted. So, yeah, if, if it's not affecting your personal life negatively, and if it's you know bringing you joy, then there's nothing wrong with it. So. I mean, this is a very old school mindset, you know, uh, back in like early 2010s, people were like ashamed of like, oh, I play a kid's game. I can't wait to win this so I can quit forever. And, you know, they would not admit to themselves that they actually enjoyed the game. There's nothing wrong with it, enjoying the game. So, um, yeah, this point is thus one I also take issue with because obviously we enjoy the game. There's nothing wrong with it. Obviously unhealthy relationships to the game mean we actually don't enjoy the game very much. You know, we have this hobby we wind up dreading. You know, I, I can't tell you how many players, you know, myself included, have dreaded the tournament games they've had to play because there's so much riding on the line. You know, reputation, you know, people, you know, who don't know what they're talking about, ready to roast you the second you let Stealth Rock go up. You know, stupid stuff like that. So yeah, if you're not enjoying the game, then you're not enjoying it. That's the relationship uh, you have with it. But... The issue is here that, oh, we, we're playing this and nothing amounts to any significance. You know, I would say, well, let me try to not say 16 things at once, as I always attempt to do. 
I would say the reason I have such distaste for it is that, you know, you lose the game, you got unlucky, people are turning on you, making fun of you, okay, sure, uh, that's, that sucks. But the response being, oh, you know, well, this game is meaningless and insignificant anyway, well, you know, you, you, you hear how that sounds very... It, it, doesn't it kind of sound like a, a guy who tries to ask out a girl and she rejects him and he goes like, you know what, I didn't even want to anyway. That's what it sounds like to me. But, uh, you know what, I, I, this is, who cares, this is stupid anyway. You know, I didn't even, I, I'm not saying he's saying I didn't even want to win because that's obviously not the case. But, yeah, it's, uh, it, it, what he's really saying is where we're going, you know, where we're, um, where we're getting into in the last paragraph. Uh, I would make this the end, but World Cup is still ongoing, but I would never leave so many great friends out to dry, so I'll suffer through a few more games for them. Yeah. The well, last thing before I leave you all to re react with disdain, ridicule, and self-righteous fervor. Um, I mean, yes, the disdain and ridicule are always going to happen, whether it's deserved or not, which is, you know, silly. Suffice to say, parts of it were deserved here, but not all of it. So, yes, I agree, not all of it was great. Self-righteousness, I think, a little rich, but, you know, okay. For you do everything in your power to minimize my words and thoughts, box them up, and shove them to some cobweb corner of your memory and hope they disappear forever as a stand on your finite time grounded dust. Here's where I think, um, I won't call it word salad, but I would say the point was a little overdriven to where it lost its immediacy, lost its impact. You know, like basically saying, I don't think anyone's going to minimize the words and thoughts by, well, I get what he's saying, that, oh, you know, there goes that crazy Lavos, you know, yelling. So I get that, but I also don't think most people are going to try and forget at all um, and hope they disappear forever as a stain on your finite time grounded up. Yeah, this, this, is, uh, this is losing losing the clarity of the previous paragraphs. And doesn't really have the and by losing that clarity also loses the impact of the metaphor I and I think uh, evoke I think evoking the limited time we have on this earth you know and you know the idea of being ground back to you know ashes to ashes dust to dust I don't think uh, that really drives the point home so yeah from this moment on, nothing you say matters to me. This is clearly not true. You know, this is like, oh, this, like the, the point we made earlier. Uh, like, oh, I don't even care. I, I mean, the whole Zen enlightenment thing, it's it's something you show. It's not something you tell other people you've achieved. Uh, but I, I get it. The foulest insults you hurl with intent to wound will calmly settle at the earth before my feet. Uh, again, with the bit lofty for this kind of thing it re again it reads less as i am enlightened and more as i am telling you i am enlightened and you are all worms and you know insignificant before the massive power of my mind or anything like that and the venom you spit again this is bringing this is too too harsh i mean the the less eloquent way to describe this would be that's you know trying too hard but the venom you spit, I, I think the way it's phrased a little awkward too. But you know, it's not egregious. Lavos, you know, clearly has a potent grasp over the English language. But you know, if if you're going to make this your lasting legacy, I think you gotta. You know, it kind of reads like a fantasy novel. You know, and those fantasy novels tend to be. You know, a little, uh, a little highfalutin, and not in a good sense. So, yeah. Uh, Venom you will bring all the pain of a warm summer breeze. Nope. Again, like it's not a bad visual, but it's way too lofty. You know, I the word pretentious gets thrown around a lot, and I pretentious the way most people use it doesn't really actually mean pretentious it means something that threatens my intelligence and that's the way people use it anyway it means something that threatens my intelligence and because I feel threatened by it I'm going to say that this is some um, nonsense that someone way too in love with their own intelligence dreamed up to try and lord their own uh, mind over mine 
but generally, rarely, the things most people accuse other people of being pretentious over, like, I don't know, French movies, is not actually very pretentious. You know, but um, this, I think, fits the definition of pretentious more because it is literally pretending. You know, and it's going to such extreme lengths to, uh, to assure the reader that uh, of the Zen enlightenment that uh, has been achieved, supposedly. You are less than anything you can conceive, which... Okay, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty good... Uh, it's got something to it, but, I mean, it, its power is then immediately undercut by the following, which is, while I carry on... I mean, Jesus Christ, just saying the words carry on. Uh, brimming with joy distilled from attachment... And obviously that is the coup de grace of uh, the whole affair. And that is, you know, the the second part of the most, the second most memed part of this whole thing. Unfortunately, it doesn't begin to describe my series, Joy Distilled from a Detachment. I mean, um, again, like, I don't know about the whole monk's journey that has been, the, that, good lord, I'm losing it of the whole monk's journey here, uh, that uh, you were so detached from all earthly material needs that uh, suddenly you have just you know transcended the spiritual plane, but yeah, um, it's, it's pretty much uh, what I was accusing the paragraph of doing already, and just ramping it up to 11. So I mean, nothing if not uh, committed to the idea. So that's it. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, let me know what you agreed on, what you disagreed on. Yeah, again, I don't really have anything personal against Lavos, but I thought this was uh, an interesting topic to revisit because even if you, you know, put uh, take it past the idea of you know one person having a meltdown, just it's worth considering the health of the relationship you have with the game. And, uh, yeah, Lavos would wind up getting banned after this. Yeah, um, not for... It was funny because Lavos had a reputation for making a lot of really racist remarks for a while, and nobody seemed to care. I remember he referred to, um, in SPL the year before this, he referred to Roscoe, who was on our team, as the token black. Roscoe is black. And... Uh, no, and, you know, when we mentioned this, people were saying, or the people in charge were saying, oh, well, that's not that bad. That's not that, you know, offensive. It's not necessarily offensive. Which is like, oh, dude, come on. He was, and that wasn't an isolated incident either, and he was um, very well known for making other similarly disparaging remarks towards those who weren't like him, let's say. And, uh... <laughs> Yeah, and the final hilarious thing was that someone... Well, I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay, so thank you once again, and I'll see you in the next one.